Today we are going to talk about the uh, optical parametric amplifier that we have in our lab. Uh, the purpose of this is whoever is in the lab, they should know what is there inside the well, the black box that is white in color. And for those who are not in the lab, we want to give you a little bit of an idea of uh, how complex it is. And uh, at first look, it might look completely baffling and you do not know what is going on inside and you do not even know what is what. But after this module, the black box will uh, not remain so black after all, right. So, the uh, OPA that we have in our lab is called Topaz C. Before going into that, let us quickly revise what we had said about optical parametric generation and amplification in the previous module. We said that uh, some frequency generation is something that we have studied earlier, where two photons of smaller energy join up in a nonlinear optical medium to produce uh, a photon of higher energy. Optical parametric generation is exactly the opposite, where a photon gets split into two consequent uh, two constituent photons obviously of smaller energies after going through a nonlinear optical medium. And then what we said is that when we write something like this that omega p equal to omega s plus omega i, the problem is that uh, there can in principle be infinite number of omega s and omega i combinations that would add up to be give omega p. There is nobody has said that omega s has to be an integer or an odd integer even integer nothing. Right? So, in principle uh, infinite number of combinations can be there, but in practice the number is limited. So, this is somewhat like the boundary conditions that we have encountered in quantum mechanics. It is limited because not only does the energy have to be conserved, the energy conservation is given by omega p equal to omega s plus omega i, but that is not the only condition. A very important condition is that momentum also has to be conserved. So, now you see the moment we say momentum has to be conserved, uh, you have uh, only certain values that omega s and omega i can take. And then if you are going to do it in uh, a collinear geometry for collinear beams, the momentum conservation uh, condition reduces to n p into omega p equal to n s into omega s plus n i into omega i. So, that uh, gives us not only a limited number of omega and omega s that we can handle can get, but also uh, we get a, a way of determining what is going to be omega s, what is going to be omega i, because one can in principle play around with the uh, uh, refractive index by changing temperature. As we will see, there are other factors as well. Of course, angle tuning is an issue. Uh, temperature is an issue, uh, there can be something else that we will see today, right. So, this typically would be the geometry of optical parametric generation, where a pumping beam is focused onto a nonlinear crystal to generate uh, idler signal and residual pump will be there. The residual pump is uh, removed and the uh, depending on what you want, the idler can also be removed to give you only the signal. Now, uh, this can be done in two ways. Uh, one is by using uh, filters of appropriate uh, energy, uh, band pass filter, long pass filter, short pass filter, something like that. Well, typically long pass filter, but polarization also has a role to play because depending on what kind of nonlinear optical crystal we take and depending on what is the polarization of the pumping beam, you will have different polarization of the signal. So, if it is OOE, then it is very simple to understand that by setting a polarizer perpendicular to the polarization of the input beam, the pump beam, you can separate out, separate out the signal without much hassle. So, polarization is also a key factor. Now, the problem with optical parametric generation, well not problem, the uh, let us say the uh, different points that one needs to keep in mind during optical parametric generation is that one can do uh, angle tuning to get phase matching like in other nonlinear optical processes. The signal and idler intensities are very, very low because uh, we are going uh, splitting uh, a photon is uh, less probable than combining two photons. Uh, you can get type 1 or type 2 phase matching depending on the NLO material and then this is very useful for IR generation and single photon creation. So, the problem here that comes out is extremely low signal and idler intensities. How do you work around that? 
one way of working around that is to put this entire thing in a cavity. If there is a resonant signal beam then automatically it is going to get amplified sort of like a laser that is what gives you an OPO optical parametric oscillator. Typically optical parametric oscillators have a repetition rates of tens of megahertz and uh, it gives you a reasonably strong signal beam. So, when you want to do some kind of a photon counting application TCSPC or uh, femtosecond optical gating OPO would be the uh, preferred light source if you have the resources to get it. OPO is actually extremely expensive ok. Pump en the energies that you get are not really uh, in millijoules they are com more or less comparable to what you get out of a tit titanium sapphire oscillator a little less than that. The other way to do it is to do optical parametric amplification and that is what we have in our lab and that is what is useful uh, for pump probe kind of applications. So, what you do here is that using the uh, pump photon the system is promoted to some virtual state and then uh, omega s this signal photon is made available at some intensity low intensity that causes the generation of another omega s. So, here you get an amplification you have one omega s photon you get two coming out of it and then of course, since energy has to be conserved omega i the frequency of the idler is also generated and here uh, what we show here is a, a typical set layout of an optical parametric amplifier where the, whether the pump and the uh, signal photons are perpendicular in polarization to each other we are using uh, LINBO3 which is uh, which gives you EOO kind of phase matching. So, what you get is you get the signal and idler to be horizontal in this setup pump remains vertical. So, next thing is you put in a polarizer and cut out the pump you can set the polarizer to horizontal polarization and then the signal and the idler goes out. Now, if you put in a filter which is going to cut out IR then the idler is cut out and you get the uh, signal coming out or if you want the idler to come out instead of the signal then what you want to do is you want to use a long pass filter which will allow IR to go through and cut the visible ok. So, this is what we have studied already and this is what our uh, white colored black box looks like topaz C this is where we do optical parametric generation. So, what we will do in the next uh, 20 minutes or so is that we will try to uh, open the lid and see what is there inside. So, first of all topaz C needs a pump beam right and the pump beam that we uh, typically feed into it in our lab is the uh, one is 1 millijoule typically 1 millijoule or 1.3 millijoule from the output of our regenerative amplifier. Our region actually produces 4 millijoule, but then uh, topaz cannot take so much of energy the optics will burn and it is not required also. I will show you at least in one slide what is the problem if you have too much pump. In case of uh, spectroscopy any kind of spectroscopy a basic working principle I do not know if I have said it already is uh, too good is no good. Sometimes you might think that you focus tightly and then uh, perfect focus is going to get you the perfect uh, output that is not correct because you focus too tightly then your optics might burn or you in case of white light generation you might get what is called filamentation ok. So, one uh, needs to optimize conditions rather than maximize anything. So, 1.3 uh, millijoule of energy is fed into topaz and the way it goes in is by this all mirror telescope. Achha, when I deal with femtosecond pulses what is the preferred uh, optics that I want to use lenses or mirrors suppose I want to focus a femtosecond pulse should I use lens or should I use concave mirror convex lens or concave mirror yeah mirror why yeah because when femtosecond pulse passes through any medium especially solid medium then it broadens the chart is brought in that is something we have studied earlier in this course. But as you see in inside topaz well uh, feeding uh, of the beam is by an all mirror telescope understandably. Later on we do use lenses and uh, we use lenses for a reason it is ok to use lens inside the topaz you will see why ok. So, uh, this is what happens 
light comes in hits mirror 1 then T m 1, T m 2, B r 1 and B r 2 and that is what uh, feeds the light into topaz. And what happens inside is this, this is the layout that you have inside topaz. So, what you see is a lot, a lot of pieces of optics and first time you open the lid and look inside you do not know what is what. You do not know which one is a mirror, which one is a beam splitter, which one is a sapphire plate, which one is a nonlinear crystal, which one is a lens. So, let us see, we will go slowly and see if you can understand. But to start with, let me give you an overview. What you have is, you have this input pump beam that is labeled 1. Okay. It goes through a beam splitter B S 1 and we will do this all over again in the next slide. This beam splitter 1 reflects almost 80 to 98 percent of the beam depending on how much power you put in to uh, this direction towards M 7. What it does? It does, uh, so th that branch is called the P A 2 power amplifier, P A means power amplifier. So, uh, 80 to 90 percent of the input beam is used as a pump for the second stage when you generate strong signal. right? So, second stage of power amplifier or sometimes it is just called the power amplifier and uh, the remaining 2 to 20 percent of light goes to beam splitter is picked up by these two lenses L 1 and L 2 convex lenses. Uh, see we are using lenses here. What is the role of this convex lenses we will discuss in the next slide, but the crux of the matter is that this second path which is denoted uh, no sorry third path which is denoted 3 here that is uh, for generation of white light. So, that, that beam is called W L G pump beam W L G means white light generation. Why do we need white light here? Because the purpose of using this uh, piece of equipment is that we want to generate different colors and we want to generate as many colors as possible at will. So, now if you want to do that since you know uh, how an OPA works anyway you understand that you have to uh, make available little uh, uh, small amounts of signal beam of as many colors as possible. If I have monochromatic signal beam then I can only amplify that color right, but that is not what we want we want wide tunability and the widest possible tunability one can get in this uh, situation is uh, by generating white light. Okay. So, white light is going to provide the signal that is going to be amplified later on. Okay. So, this uh, num path 3 is for white light generation pump beam that what it does is uh, it goes and uh, it produces the white light. I do not know if it is very easy to uh, easy for you to see here, but we will see it later on. So, do not worry. Fourth one is P A 1 pump beam. What does that mean? Okay, you generate white light here. You see this W L G written in white and do you see this beam that is in uh, do you see the white beam that white beam number 5 is the white light beam. So, white light generation takes place here on a sapphire plate very much like what you do in your uh, pump probe experiment. Then this white light goes straight on to this N C 1 can you read N C 1 written in white. So, this N C 1 is the first nonlinear crystal there white light goes in as a signal and then uh, path 4 is your uh, P A 1 pump beam P A 1 P A here is once again P A means power amplifier, but P A 1 is also called a pre amplifier. So, what you do here is that in this N C 1 you generate uh, the first you amplify the signal beam for the first time okay. and see what has happened. So, the reason why it is drawn in yellow is that what it means is you select which component of white light you want to amplify. Okay. How you select we will come to that. Okay. One of the components of white light one of the, so, so, this component color is the optical parameter we are amplifying an optical parameter right the optical parameter amp amplifying is a particular color or frequency. So, that signal is amplified first then it goes here. So, this is path 6 path 6 is a signal beam goes here comes straight 
and then here you see there is another nonlinear crystal NC2 that is your amplifier. So, already uh, once amplified uh, signal beam is amplified for the second time in this NC2 and how is it amplified? Here now what you do is one thing I want to say is on this NC you see this white light and the pump are actually collinear. From this diagram it might look that they are a little non collinear it is they are not they are perfectly collinear. Okay. And here in the second stage what you have is you have this 98 80 to 98 percent of the light that was there in path 2 P A 2 pump beam that is also made incident on that. No, I made a little bit of mistake here it is non collinear sorry on N C 1 it is non collinear because you want to separate the pump from the signal. In the second part in N C 2 it is collinear okay, right and then you have some uh, dichroic mirror here which lets the signal go through and reflects the pump beam. So, pump beam, beam can come out from this port. Okay. Of course, what you could do is that this pump beam itself is going through nonlinear crystal. If you want, you can uh, block the signal beam and tune this nonlinear linear crystal so that you will get second harmonic of the pump beam. That is a very easy way of generating 400 nanometer light bypassing the OPA. Right. So, now let us see uh, what the beam path is and to do that I feel it is easier if you just draw the schematics like this and this is a cartoon of what you would see when you open the lid. And if you do not know what is what it is a perfect uh, hodgepodge impossible to understand what is going on here. So, what we will do is uh, that is why animation is required. Uh, we will see step by step what these beam paths are right. So, here is your pump beam 800 nanometer 1 millijoule what is the repetition rate 1 kilohertz. The first piece of optics it hits is a beam splitter not a dichroic beam splitter just a regular beam splitter which reflects a, a beam splitter is just a partially reflecting mirror right like the output coupler of any laser that you can think of. So, it reflects as we said earlier 80 to 90 percent of the beam of the light and sends it towards M 7 that is your path 2 P A 2 pump beam. We will come back to it later even though it is called path 2 we will not discuss it to start with we will come back to it later. There are other things that we want to talk about. Now, what happens to the remaining uh, 2 to 20 percent of the beam it would propagate straight right and then you have this L 1 and L 2. What is we take a rain check on the question why is it okay to use lenses you will understand uh, why it is okay shortly. But can you tell me I have two lenses one after the other what is that arrangement called optics optics class 8 class 9 class 10. Have you ever seen anything any device as a toy which has two lenses one behind the other telescope binocular is a uh, uh, I mean modification of telescope just it has two telescopes joined together right. So, telescope right and what what happens when you have two lenses you have parallel beam coming in the first lens focuses right. And after the focal point it is a diverging beam both are convex lenses remember. So, second lens picks up this diverging beam right this is what I am saying you have this parallel beam you have a lens like this it gets focused and after the focal point it is a diverging beam is very simple actually I am sure you know it I am doing it as a revision. Now, when I put the second lens I want to put the second lens in such a way that the focal length of the first beam is also the focal length of the second beam. Okay. But they need not be uh, two lenses of equal focal length. Okay. Let us say that the focal lengths are equal. 
then what will happen? You will generate the same collimated beam, okay, right, but makes no sense. Why, why put the lenses in between unnecessarily? But if you have a situation like this, where the second lens has a smaller focal length than the first one, then what will happen? Then the output beam will have a smaller beam diameter, right. Conversely, if the second lens has a longer focal length, then the output after the telescope is going to have a larger uh, diameter, right. So, the reason why one uses a telescope is in case you have want uh, to change the uh, beam diameter, want to make it shorter, want to make it longer, you use a telescope comprising two convex lenses, where two convex lenses with different focal lengths depending on whether you want to expand the beam or whether you want to well I do not want to use the word contract de expand the beam maybe maybe contract the beam the uh, you are going to use the lens with focal length first or second. In this case the case that we are discussing we use a focal length uh, we use a uh, longer focal length first. So, what I am saying is L 1 has a longer focal length, L 2 has a uh, shorter focal length. So, what will it be? Will the beam get expanded or contracted, right? So, the purpose of using this telescope is that, that we want to uh, make the beam diameter a little smaller because after this stage it has to go through some iris. So, you do not want the beam to be too large. Of course, you can put an iris and cut out part of the beam but then you are losing out on energy. That is why you need uh, arrangement like this. So, this telescopic arrangement is very common in optical uh, instruments, uh, especially if you want to do microscopy and all, uh, they are ubiquitous, they are there everywhere, all right. So, what we have learned so far is the beam comes in, hits B S 1, almost all of it gets reflected, a small part of it gets transmitted and the size of the beam is decreased by using a telescope comprising of L 1 and L 2, okay. What happens after that? Uh, we will study in the next module.